right? For the uh, thank you for joining us for the role of acupuncture in managing symptoms related to cancer treatment. Um, before we begin talking, I'll just go over the agenda for the evening. Um, I will be speaking about acupuncture and East Asian medicine, and then Shady will be giving her perspective about uh, receiving acupuncture services at Mass General during treatment. And then finally, Amy will be speaking about the benefits of acupuncture with some evidence-based research. Um, we will complete the webinar with um, more information about accessing the acupuncture services at Mass General. Um, before we dive into talking about acupuncture and East Asian medicine, I will go over a few of the definitions that um, are terms that we will be using tonight. So these are from the National Cancer Institute. Um, alternative treatments, they are considered um, alternatives to what a standard or allopathic treatment would be. So using a special diet instead of uh, cancer, traditional cancer treatment, which would be chemo, radiation, or surgery. Um, complementary are treatments that are used along with these standard treatments or allopathic treatments but um, are, you, are not used at the same location. Where integrative, um, which is the model we use at Mass General, it's a type of medical care that combines both conventional and complementary therapies. Um, this is a relatively new field. Um, I, Amy will be speaking to this a little bit further on in the webinar, but Currently, there are more than 60% of the NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers in the country now incorporate acupuncture as an integrative therapy for symptom management. And we can, we can do the next slide, Devin. Thank you. Um, this is quite remarkable because over 20 years ago when I started as an oncology nurse, there was there was no integrative therapies. Um, it's grown during that time and it's specifically grown at Mass General. Um, I became interested in acupuncture through patients that I took care of um, early on that would say they were able to have some benefit from their nausea or their stress or insomnia through acupuncture. And I learned from them um, the effectiveness of it and also um, just how gentle it can be, yet effective without side effects. So as an oncology nurse looking to help manage patient symptoms, this intrigued me and thus I um, went back to school and studied acupuncture and Chinese herbs. Um, going back to Mass General, I have just a little history of our integrative therapies program, specifically the acupuncture services. Irene Martenik, um, our program manager, she started the program in 2003. There's just one acupuncturist at the time. We currently now have grown to a team of seven acupuncturists. Um, the clinical areas have, have also expanded over that time. Um, so in Boston, we are in the infusion unit, adult and pediatric. Radiation oncology has a group clinic, which is slightly modified now due to COVID, the COVID impact. Um, and then we're also in inpatient and adult and pediatric floors, um, which is really great for continuity of care. So we might see patients in infusion, and then if they have to be admitted for some reason, we can continue and follow them. Um, we also have acupuncture at two of our satellite clinics, Danvers, both in radiation and infusion, and then Waltham, which is the infusion unit that I work on. Um, so just as an overview, we, we look to optimize health, quality of life and clinical outcomes for our patients using the evidence-informed and evidence-based fields of oncology acupuncture. Um, so now we will talk a little bit more about what acupuncture in East Asian medicine is. And this explains the, the five pillars of traditional East Asian medicine. So these five pillars make up a comprehensive medical system dating back to 700 BC, um, so truly ancient. And um, 
ideally these five pillars are used to utilize the body's innate ability to heal itself. Um, specifically, nutrition and movement medicine are really considered daily maintenance. Um, this is core to the medicine and the acupuncture, herbal medicine, and tweena massage are considered um, to be used when there's a disharmony or an imbalance or some ailment, so those are often used. Um, and just to, to know that East Asian medicine includes traditional Korean medicine, Japanese Kampo medicine, Southeast Asian medicine, and then more commonly known traditional Chinese medicine. Um, it's a paradigm shift from Western medicine. And I can say when I was studying acupuncture and Chinese herbs after having um, worked as a nurse for several, for 10 years or so, it, it, it was a little bit of a shift. Um, but I'd say that just keeping an open mind and then realizing that a lot of their, the information that was recorded came from a time period where there was no imaging and there were no labs. And it's, it's really quite remarkable um, how in depth the medicine um, that, they, that is studied and passed on really is. So it was, it was really interesting to study this. It's a three year course, um, a master's degree program. And I studied here um, at the New England School of Acupuncture, which is now merged with Mass College of Pharmacy. Um, and we can go to the next slide, Devin. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to review some of the fundamentals of the medicine. So yin yang is really considered um, to be the single most distinctive theory of East Asian medicine. Um, as seen on the screen, you can see the symbol that is synonymous with yin yang, yin being on the left, yang being on the right, and essentially yin yang represents opposite but complementary qualities. And this was first written in text back in 700 BC in the Yijing Book of Changes. Um, Ted Kaptek, who wrote The Web That Has No Weaver, he's a Harvard professor, he describes yin yang um, he, as labels to describe how things function in relation to each other. And I, since I always appreciate um, looking at the Western perspective also, I not only the night and day and the light, the dark and the light, but also thinking about inhalation and exhalation and the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. So there's all these dynamics that take place in the body where you have opposing forces, but both are needed for health. So that's essentially what is the balance in Chinese medicine or, or what is to be balanced is um, the yin yang, the balance of the body. Um, and then the next slide, we will talk about qi, which, thanks, um, which is the literal translation is breath. This is the Chinese character. Um, it's sort of modernized version is the combination of genetics, a healthy diet and fresh air. So I always think of like nature nurture takes a little bit of both. Um, the, the key piece of health maintenance is really apparent in East Asian medicine and taking care of your body and body movement. Um, and then this quote is from the classics, when qi flows freely, yin, yang, and the whole person is in balance. If qi is unbalanced, stagnant, or blocked, it can lead to illness. So this is where um, acupuncture comes in, but um, we're always looking to kind of strike that balance with the body and with health and with our lifestyle. Um, a few other notes about qi. Um, it's similar to the Hindu concept of prana and yoga. That's often used to describe this life force or life energy. Um, we say chi travels within the meridians. I have a slide further on that will show the acupuncture model with the meridians running through the body. Um, so chi travels through that, and when we utilize acupuncture, we're manipulating the chi within the channels. Okay, and on to oncology acupuncture. Oh, here's the, the slide with the acupuncture model demo. So you see meridians, 
the lines running up and down, and then there's points throughout. So it's over 360 points on the body. Um, I'd say there's probably 50 that are very commonly used, um, but there's, there's really points um, throughout the body. Um, so I'm gonna explain acupuncture, and then we actually have a short video following this to show what um, acupuncture needling looks like. But simply put, it involves inserting needles or pins. I find pins is a little bit less um, scary sounding than needles. Um, they're non-cord, which means there's no medicine, there's no hole, it. so it just spreads the skin. They're sterile, single use. They go at certain specific points on the body with the goal of improving the flow of chi and treating a variety of ailments. So it's essentially you're trusting the body to do what it naturally knows how to do. You're just sort of signaling by putting the pins in a certain area and trying to move the body in that direction. What it what it innately knows how to do, balance itself. Um, so common ailments that we see in oncology patients include nausea, fatigue, stress, anxiety, insomnia, hot flashes, constipation, and then chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy. And I think, um, okay, this slide here. Um, this is part of, um, part of the assessment when we're doing an intake on a patient for an acupuncture treatment is we sort of do a deep dive into asking a lot of questions. Um, there's four pillars of assessment, looking, listening, touching, asking. I find that the questions that we ask as acupuncturists are very detailed, um, specific. If you wake up at night, what time is it? Do you have trouble falling asleep or do you have trouble waking up at night? And there's all of those means something different in terms of a diagnosis. Um, also something with hot flashes, is there a certain time of day? Are there exacerbating factors like coffee or wine? Where do the lo where's the location of the hot flashes starting from? Um, are they only during the night or are they also during the day? So sometimes it seems almost like a little bit on overdrive, the questions, but they all have a meaning and we use that information, we gather that, as well as taking um, a look at the tongue assessment. So looking at the color, um, if there's moisture on the tongue, if there's any redness, if it's a pale tongue, so all that means something. And then we feel the pulse and also get information on how the body is um, the state of the body is in. So if you have a bounding pulse, oftentimes you'd see that with a fever, a really full response, the body has a full response of bounding. Um, or if someone um, was just run, you know, just feeling run down, just getting over a flu, their pulse might be more weak as their body's just trying to recover. So all of this is based in the observation over a long period of time. Um, and this is how you decide what points that you want to use and what your treatment strategy is. Okay, thanks, Devin. I can do the next slide. Okay, and here's a video of an auricular acupuncture treatment. And we clean the locations with alcohol prior to putting the pins in. You can see um, the pins are hair thin. And usually with an auricular treatment, we, we do two or three pins per ear. And then the following video will be body abdominal acupuncture. So there's a guide tube with the longer pins. It stays sterile before inserting. And the pins, you know, they're only going in one or two millimeters into the skin. And 
that's Irene, her manager. She's doing some measurement. Great, thank you for that, Devin. Um, so it's putting the pins in, um, I think it helps to see it. Sometimes we have patients that don't want another pin in them. They've had an IV, they've had their port access, they don't want anything else. Um, I think when I show them what the pins look like, it, it seems um, a little bit less scary. I, I did do PD acupuncture for a while and I'd say um, 12 and under, we would just do acupressure on patients. Um, but some of the older teens were completely fine with the pins. I think most of the time, if someone's a little bit nervous about having the pins, they, they might, when you know they're, they're brave and they try it, and they, they'll usually say, oh, that was fine. So I think it's a little bit of just kind of getting over the thought of it. Um, so this slide is, a, is just um, a slide about pattern identification. I won't go into all the details, but it's just a way we organize information. And I used the example on the left for the case that will be the following slide, um, blood deficiency. So I think it's important to note that these um, terms do not clinically mean that the patient's anemic. It's, this is where there's this, it's, it's different than Western medicine. Um, however, a lot of the the manifestations could be very similar. So patients tired, they have insomnia or anxious, restless sleep, pale complexion, their hair's dry, their skin's dry, they might also have constipation, so this dryness in the system, um, lack of moisture, they might even have some dizziness. We check their tongue and it's pale and the pulse feels really thin. So um, that's a pretty good example of someone that might be clinically anemic, um, but in this case, it, it, we don't know what the labs are necessarily um, if thinking about when, when the patterns were written back 700 BC. So these are sort of in, based on the ancient um, observations. So chi deficiency in the middle, I always think of, of a patient that might be really run down, they're just recovering from a cold or a flu, and their bodies just this sense of weakness. They just don't have their oomph with them. Um, and then deficient yin, this is where we go back to the yin yang and there might be the yang, the heat is overcoming the yin, there's not as much yin, the balance is off. So then we start to see a little bit too much heat in the body. And then finally, chi stasis on the right. So this can be anything from a pain in the body or sometimes stress. I'd say um, East Asian medicine actually has it, it's able to correlate emotional and mental states with physical, and I think that's important that, um, to note that it validates just how someone feels is, is also related to physically how they feel and it follows their pattern. Um, if we go to the next slide, I have just an example of an acupuncture note and just a mini case, and this is just, um, 48-year-old female undergoing chemo for breast cancer. She's complaining of insomnia and fatigue. She has a difficult time falling asleep. She feels tired, awake, feeling unrested. There's some slight anxiety, poor appetite, and pale complexion. Um, labs are all within normal limits. We, we always check our labs prior to uh, treatment. We want to make sure there's enough white of the white blood cells and neutrophils, the frontline fighters to prevent infection, and then we also make sure they're the platelet count is adequate too. Um, we have other criteria to treat, but those are the main lab ones that we that we look at. So the strategy, we wanna nourish your blood, calm the mind, and then there's a point, there's a point prescription. And then we try to see this patient weekly, four to six weeks, and then reevaluate and see how she's feeling. Um, in addition to the acupuncture, this is the piece that's important, is the nutrition and the movement, and we'd say, to, you know, if you can do the iron-rich foods, hopefully this patient's also seeing our nutritionist at Mass General, but we'd recommend green leafy veggies, red meat if they eat it, and bone broth. Um, and then doing encouraging gentle movement, Tai Chi or Qi Gong to help um, circulate Qi and blood. And then and just general sleep hygiene. So there's a lot of education in, a different, in addition to 
um, using the acupuncture points. So the next slide is just a visual of one of the main points that we use for a treatment for a patient that has some blood deficiency, either insomnia or fatigue. And this is um, probably one of like the premier acupuncture points. If you've had acupuncture, very likely you've had this point pinned. Um, it's, it's definitely a star in the, in the acupuncture world. Um, it tonifies chi, blood, yin, yang, an original chi. Um, it's great for any GI issues. So for this patient, she, she was feeling run, um, she was feeling tired, fatigued. Um, she was also having poor appetite. So with this point, we can succinctly treat um, a couple of things of uh, a couple of her symptoms. And then it also strengthens resistance to exterior pathogens. Um, so it's a big, and we consider it immune, an immune boosting point. So important for um, our, our one of our chemo patients. And the next slide I have is on treatment plans. So typically, we would say a weekly session. Acupuncture works best when it's regularly scheduled. Um, ideally, I see somebody weekly for four to six weeks. By the fourth week, I expect to see some changes and improvements. Um, patients might do a course of acupuncture and feel better, and then we might switch to every other week or do a monthly maintenance. So there, you do graduate from treatment usually. Um, and I've had patients that I might be seeing for in the oncology infusion unit, but maybe they had acupuncture years ago for migraines and they'll say it cured my migraines, which is, which is great. Um, so it's, it can be for certain things really helpful and, and um, have some long lasting effects. Um, we see, we we're seeing patients privately in, in our fee for service clinic right now that is on hold due to COVID. Um, so then we can safely reopen the private clinics. We will be doing that. Um, in the meantime, we are seeing patients in our infusion units for a mini treatment, which is ear points and a combination of acupressure. And these are free. They're about 20 to 30 minutes. And it's a really nice way for patients that are new to acupuncture to experience acupuncture for the first time. Um, we usually recommend the treatment course and go over it with patients and then reevaluate as needed. And then the next slide is on health promotion. So this is a real interest of mine is promoting health during chemo. I think it's really important for patients to realize that yes, you can, can you know, can continue promoting your health. And um, integrative oncology, we really feel that we can optimize health, quality of life and clinical outcomes with concurrent treatment of acupuncture during chemo or radiation. And this alone, I think, empowers patients. It feels like, like they have a sense of control, that they're doing something positive for their, their body during a challenging time. Um, we set goals to include regular acupuncture, or for, we encourage patients to utilize other supportive care services that we have at the Cancer Center, such as massage, and then in the expressive arts therapies, music, and art, as well as lifestyle medicine and yoga. Um, we're here to support and encourage these healthy changes as you move through treatment. And finally, um, this, this slide I just had to throw in. Um, so it also promotes the relaxation response, which I would say is what we, we first hear as acupuncturists from patients. Um, once the pins are in, there's a sense of calm and rest. I've had patients immediately fall off to sleep a lot will drift away and just kind of go into this nice little zone space where they feel really calm and rested um, so i think that does hold through as this mom in the picture might um, be feeling from a treatment earlier in the day um, and i think i might have mentioned this before but i just i feel it's important um, that with East Asian medicine, there's this validation of the mental, of the mental and emotional health, and how it's interconnected with the physical health. Um, I think we all know if 
we're feeling run down, then we just might be feeling down. So I think it's really important to recognize that, um, you know, the need that those two are connected and that we can help with um, helping with anxiety and stress and um, how that manifests in the body. Acupuncture can be helpful for that um, in our patients. Um, so at this point, I'm going to switch it over to um, my lovely patient that I've treated before, previously, um, Sadie. Thank you so much, Sadie. We're so fortunate to have you here tonight. Thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm kind of excited. <laughs> um, so... I guess I'm just going to go into what my experience has been with acupuncture with Mary at, at the Infusion Center in Waltham. Uh, when I started chemo in January of 2018, my first infusion, I did not have the acupuncture and the acupressure. And after my first infusion, I went home and I did feel nauseous after a day or two. I started to feel nauseous. I was very, um, I wasn't overly, of course it was my first infusion, but I started to feel the nausea and I started to feel fatigue. Then I came in on my second, for my second infusion two weeks later and Mary showed herself and she said, hey, you can do this acupuncture and acupressure for free while you get your infusion would you like to do that and I said absolutely what are, what what is it going to do and she said well it should help with your nausea and it should help with your fatigue I said uh, sign me up I'm good that sounds good to me so we started on my second infusion and I had eight infusions so that means I had Mary come to me for seven infusions um, even after the the second infusion after that um, encounter with Mary and the acupuncture and the acupressure, I did not feel as nauseous. I did not have as much nausea as I had the previous couple of weeks. And I also didn't have the strong fatigue that I had the first couple of weeks. And as time went on, uh, I realized that I wasn't there was not one time that I threw up during my, my treatments because my nausea was just not there. Um, I had other side effects. Of course, you know, the taste goes away and you're kind of like, what am I eating? It feels like cardboard, you know, a lot of those different things, but I didn't have the nausea and I didn't have the, the, I don't think my fatigue was as intense. Um, but of course, because you're going through chemo and there, there are a lot of things that, that come into play and during that time there was a lot of downtime for me what i noticed was that um so so in having those treatments i thought okay that that's really fantastic whenever i went in to have a treatment i brought someone different with me every time to keep me company and my mother came with me one and she noticed that I was getting the acupuncture and the acupressure and she asked a lot of questions and I think she, I remember her asking you a lot of questions Mary about what it would do and and uh and because my mother was having some pains you know in her legs and and different things and so she was wanted to know about that and she already knew how it was affecting me. She knew that I was doing well under the acupressure and acupuncture. So she asked about that. And she subsequently did get acu acupuncture herself for the pains that she was having. And they did, she felt quite different with the pains that she was having in her legs. But what was interesting to me is after I'd finished all of my infusions which meant the opportunity to do the acupuncture or the acupressure in the same way I was having hot flashes a lot more hot flashes because then after my um, oh also I didn't have hot flashes during my treatments 
for some reason. I'm not sure if it's uh, because of the acupuncture and acupressure, because I wasn't on hormone therapy necessarily at that time, but the chemo tend to work in the same way because it's kind of suppressing my, my hormones. And I would imagine that I would still be getting hot flashes. I did not have them during that time. It was only after that time that I started having hot flashes when I started on my hormone therapy. And so my mom said to me, she said, well, have you looked into doing acupuncture acu for the hot flashes? And I said, no, but that's a good idea. She says, well, I think that you should look into it because of the experience that she had with you, Mary, at the infusion center when I was getting acupressure while I was getting my uh, treatments. So I actually did seek out an acupuncturist through the Healing Garden in Harvard, Mass. And I did find someone and they did actually help a lot with, initially with my uh, hot flashes because of course it was summertime at the, at the time. And in the summer, the hot flashes are a lot worse. And I also didn't, I wasn't uh, aware enough to know that when I maybe have a glass of wine, I will have more hot flashes than when I don't have a glass of wine. And I wasn't aware enough of the different things that I could do beyond that to kind of temper the, the hot flashes. So it was, it was great for me to be able to get acupuncture during that time um, after my treatments in order to help with the hot flashes. And I do believe also it helped with the fatigue. I was never so overly fatigued that I couldn't manage my life because I did actually continue going to work even while I was having um, my infusions um, and um, radiation and and everything. So I went, I, I continued going to work. The only time I stopped going to work was the six to eight weeks that I needed following surgery. So, um, so my experience with acupuncture and acupressure has been fantastic as I can't. I, I think that it really helped to make the whole process a lot easier, a lot calmer because, um, you know, I would see you come and be like, yay. <laughs> and somehow it would just call me. And then, you know, you would do the acupuncture and then the acupressure. And it was, it was, um, it was very calming. But I also feel, I, I think I felt I could feel the flow a lot of times through my body of what was happening, which was really nice. So so that's my story. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> um, I wasn't nervous about getting the acupuncture because I'd had it twice before, um, randomly. My husband's uncle was, is a chiropractor and he'd been trained in acupuncture. So I'd had it before, so I wasn't nervous about getting the acupuncture. The needles do not hurt. They are so thin that um, I think what it was that uh, Mary said that if it hurt, you just kind of have to wiggle it a little bit because it means that it's kind of in the wrong, you know, position or something, but they don't hurt. Um, uh, you said, <laughs> uh, so no, it didn't, it didn't hurt. It felt it. You, you hardly feel them because they're so thin. You hardly feel them, but they're, they're thin, tiny, powerful little pin things. <laughs> uh, yes, they have the service at, in Waltham at the, um, what is it? Uh, Mass General West in Waltham, which is on 2nd Street or Avenue, uh, right in the thick of things. So it's right off of the highway. And um, 
a cancer buddy, cancer buddy for me. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> yes, it's a, uh, I go there. <laughs> I can bring my mom. I go there. I now go every three months um, to get, you know, my shot. And um, I've learned to, I've learned how to manage for the most part, my, um, my hot flashes. I know if I do something that I'm not supposed to do, thank you, that's so kind. If I do something I'm not supposed to do, then I will have more hot flashes than not. I do not have night sweats, which is, um, I, I do not have night sweats, which is a, which is a good thing. Um, my date of diagnosis was December of 2017. And so I spent um, about seven months battling. And so we are going to be three years removed in December. So I'm very excited about that. And uh, so far, so good. Thank you so much, Z. Thank you for Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> uh, Dr. Commander, I can now pull up your slide now. I just want to start off by thanking our previous two speakers. Mary, you did such an amazing job of explaining acupuncture to all of us in a way we can all understand because I know it's very complicated. And Sadie, I am so moved by your story. Thank you for sharing how acupuncture really helped you optimize your health during your chemotherapy treatment and beyond. It's really inspiring, I'm sure, to many who are watching this webinar. So I just wanted to provide a little bit more information. Um, I'm a breast oncologist with a strong interest in integrative therapies, as Devin noted early on, and I've been so privileged to learn so much from Mary about the role of acupuncture in helping manage symptoms in our patients. So it's really interesting in learning more about acupuncture in the field of oncology that in our country, about one in 10 cancer survivors have tried acupuncture. So that's really amazing. In addition, as Mary noted early on in her presentation, over 60% of National Cancer Institute designated cancer centers incorporate acupuncture for cancer symptom management. That is pretty amazing if you think about it, since I know acupuncture has really been adopted in the field of oncology, I think only since the 1970s. So this is a really interesting statistic. Next slide. I was also really interested to see that the National Cancer Institute held a symposium dedicated to acupuncture for symptom management and oncology back in the summer of 2016. This monograph is actually available for free on the internet. I usually don't recommend that people Google things, but this is a great resource if you wanna learn more about the role of acupuncture in oncology. At this symposium, um, the leaders brought together scientists and scholars from all over the world, all of whom have a strong interest in understanding the scientific basis of acupuncture and the role in managing symptoms in our cancer patient population. And it's a really excellent review that touches on many of the topics I'm gonna to discuss in these next few slides. Next slide. So one really interesting thing to think about and study is how does acupuncture actually work? Certainly from a scientific perspective, there are many mechanisms that, that have, mechanisms that have been proposed to help understand you know, the effects of acupuncture and they're very complex and involve multiple systems in the body. Acupuncture needling and manipulation results in a variety of physiological effects in the nervous system. One really interesting mechanism that's been proposed is looking at the role of endorphins. Maybe you've heard of endorphins. These are actually hormones that are released in our brain that bind to the pain receptors, also known as opiate receptors, and help essentially dull pain. So are endorphins being released during acupuncture? That is one proposed mechanism of many. In addition, neuroscientists have a technology called functional brain MRI, where they can actually put a person in an MRI machine, 
I guess, while they've had acupuncture or shortly after they've had acupuncture and look at actual changes that are occurring in the brain after acupuncture. And it's been demonstrated that certain parts of the brain that are involved in how we process pain may be affected by acupuncture. And so that's a really interesting area of research as well. I should note that there are many scientific gaps still in, in our understanding between these mechanisms and how acupuncture actually works in real people. And if we have time to discuss this further, I'm sure Mary has many interesting thoughts about this as well. Next slide. An important question that many of you may be thinking, you know, I'm in the middle of chemotherapy, is acupuncture actually safe at this time? And that's why we're so fortunate to have specialists like Mary, since she is specialized in oncology acupuncture and certainly knows the concerns that our patients are facing. In addition, she's an oncology nurse, so she knows about the importance of the blood counts. Is the white blood cell okay? Count okay? Are the platelets okay? Is this particular patient at increased risk for infection? Could this patient be dehydrated? What is the nutritional status of the patient? So someone like Mary can take all of these factors into account to determine the appropriate treatment plan for that individual. Next slide. So on this slide, I've really outlined many symptoms that our patients experience during the course of treatment. And Sadie, I think you alluded to almost all of the things on this list here. Um, certainly, Sadie specifically addressed how acupuncture helped with her fatigue during chemotherapy, how it helped improve her nausea, and later she tried it to help manage hot flashes. And so there is literature to support the role of acupuncture for managing all of these specific symptoms. For example, we know cancer-related pain is a major challenge that many of our patients face, and there has been considerable research looking at the role of acupuncture in addition to some of our traditional pain medications, and it's found that the acupuncture does provide additional benefit, which should be considered. When it comes to joint pains, this is something I see every day as a breast oncologist. Many of my patients have joint pain secondary to a medication called an aromatase inhibitor. And there actually has been a randomized trial demonstrating that acupuncture does provide benefit for management of joint pains in women who experience this symptom. I know there was a webinar just two weeks ago which really focused on the role of acupuncture in managing peripheral neuropathy. So I strongly recommend that you go on the MGH Cancer website to watch that webinar and learn more about this specific topic. So all of these symptoms have been shown in research studies to derive benefit from the use of acupuncture. Next slide. Thank you so much, Amy and Sadie. Um, this is, we're sort of wrapping up at this point um, before the Q&A portion, but I want to give the contact information for patients that are interested. Um, I do want to note um, the past six months have change some of the schedules um, due to COVID. So um, at this point, we're just seeing active treat, um, patients that are actively in treatment and are already coming into the hospital um, when we can safely have the fee-for-service patients coming in. Um, so former patients are always welcome to continue. Um, that's on hold until um, we kind of get clearance from infection control. Um, but you'll see the contact information and email for patients and um, we really encourage you to reach out with any questions or concerns. We'd be happy to help guide you. Um, we also give referrals for um, acupuncturists out in the community if uh, during this time because we can't see um, patients privately. Um, we'd be happy to help um, with that. And then the next slide, I just have some acupuncture resources. Um, there's several from the Oncology Nursing Society that link into some of the studies that Amy had mentioned. There's also another one on sleep. I didn't have room to add it, but it's interesting because it actually talks about um, using CBT, um, cognitive-based therapy, and acupuncture for insomnia. So that was, that was an interesting study. Um, but these ones listed are for acupuncture independently, so for fatigue, hot flashes, and for pain management. And then finally at the bottom, um, one of the sort of more 
easier books to read about um, East Asian medicine is the web that has no weaver understanding Chinese medicine um, by Ted Kapchik. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to you, Devin. Mary, um, we have time now for some questions. But before we get there, I just want to remind everyone that next week is our last session um, as part of the integrative therapy series going to be on yoga so we hope that you can join us and on the page here is the link to register if you'd like to join us or if you'd like to look back on the previous recordings and if anyone would like to follow us on social media here are our uh, our handles and thank you again for um to our speakers this evening this was a great discussion uh Sadie especially for sharing your experiences just going to look into the chat box now and see if we have some questions. Um, what is a good source of information about herbs? How do I know what is safe? I would say we use this at Mass General. Memorial Sloan Kettering has a website on, uh, or on their main website about um, herbs and supplemental meds. So we use that. Um, there's there's a lot of concerns with using um, East Asian herbs during chemo. So um, my bottom line is I just tell patients no to avoid it. Um, for definitely for other issues that are non-oncologic, it can be very helpful. Um, just as a side note, um, one of the active ingredients in Tamiflu is a Chinese herb. So there's definitely a use for it, but um, I would say not in oncology at this point. Um, but some patients that are interested in learning about supplements or some herbs for maybe post-treatment, um, I believe it's Ask Herbs. I can try to look it up, but if you go to the Memorial Sloan Kettering website, they have, um, they have a nice link there to help with understanding herbs. That's the one I use. About herbs, Irene just wrote in the text box. So um, it's, it's really important because of, you know, just we have to be thinking about the liver and the kidneys and there's a lot of safety um, that goes into taking any, really any supplement or herb during chemo. So we're very cautious about that. Thank you. Uh, another question. Um, I've taken an immunotherapy in the past, which has caused um, tiny isolated itchy bumps, more intense, different times with different flare ups. Um, could acupuncture do anything for this? I would defer to your oncologist um, or dermatologist. Um, I think having a diagnosis before we can sort of um, create a treatment plan. So I would want to gather more information to understand. It, it sounds like based maybe on the immunotherapy, whatever, however that's affecting the immune system is creating this. So I probably want to get a little bit more information, but it potentially could be an option. Um, I definitely, you know, you, with all of um, our acupuncture patients, we have um, clearance from their NP or MD prior to treatment. So I think it, after having, um, after having some more information, um, and if they feel like they're not quite sure and let's try it, then by all means, it might be something that would be effective. Um, we have to be a little bit careful with any open areas. We don't put pins into open areas, obviously for infection. Um, so there might be some other strategies that we could try, but it might be worth talking to somebody after your doctor approves um, acupuncture. I would agree with that, Mary, unfortunately. While we're so excited about the field of immunotherapy on all these new drugs that we have in our arsenal, many of them can cause all kinds of rashes. So as Mary stated, I think it's really important to see your doctor, perhaps see a dermatologist who specializes in that area to get insight into that before trying complementary therapies. But certainly um, for symptom control, perhaps it would be helpful after you've explored those options. A question about, I believe, on needle placement. Where is the location for hot flashes and night sweats with acupuncture? Um, there are multiple locations. Um, I, if you, if I can speak to you further, if you're able to submit an email to Devin, I'd be happy to just um, 
contact you directly and give you some information. There's, there's several to include in this. Um, who can I talk to at Waltham about scheduling um, acupuncture there during my infusions? I work on Tuesdays in Waltham, so unfortunately it's a limited schedule. If you happen to be a Tuesday patient, um, you can talk to your nurse or your provider um, and we can start, I can, I can start seeing you. Um, fortunately right now it's, um, it's a limited schedule, but that would be the first step is to talk to your nurse or provider. I know I referred a patient Mary the other day to come in, she's coming in on Tuesday and she was so excited to meet with you. And similar to what Sadie has told us, really found so much benefit to receive the treatment during, during her chemo. So, thank you. Another question. Um, I am sensitive to needles. Will an acupressure treatment give me the same benefit as using acupuncture needles? Great question. Okay. Well, I would say it's very close. Um, it's the pins are going to have a different, a different level of intensity because we're treating in and we're connecting with the fascia. There's been, just as a side note, a lot of recent research about how the fascia, which is this sort of sheath that kind of encloses the organs and vessels, um, and how that actually may impact how we can put an acupuncture pin in someone's foot and it helps their head. So just sort of understanding the connection within the body. Um, so the pins bring it in, it's only a few millimeters, but we are going internally. With acupressure, it's all um, non-insertion pressure. It can still be effective. Um, a good example is um, patients that wear C-bands for nausea. That's the empirical point for nausea, which is usually two thumbs down um, between the tendons on the wrist or forearm, lower forearm. So um, patients that use those for nausea and that helpful form of acupressure. So it can definitely still be beneficial. Um, and say, such as when I was working in pediatrics, I did a lot of acupressure and I, it, it can still elicit a, a strong effect on patients. Thank you. And um, are patients who are currently being treated in proton radiation, um, how, how do they get involved? So we have a group radiation clinic um, that's been in, it's on, in Boston, um, lower level, under lower level two. Um, we have a sign up in, so the schedulers in the radiation department can help with signing up for acupuncture. It's, it's more limited than it used to be. Um, at, and they need a referral from their oncologist before signing up. Um, however, we used to we have we used to have five reclining chairs, um, and I, I believe now and Irene, who's on, might be able to let me know if, if we're just seeing patients one on one because due to COVID constraints. One on one, yeah. So right now, one on one is a little bit more limited, but I would say absolutely reach out to your provider and try to get on the schedule. And in, with radiation, you're coming in five days a week, so there's more chances obviously to um, get a session in. It's, um, referrals are needed for both massage and acupuncture and radiation oncology. Well, thank you everyone. That's all the time that we have for this evening. Um, I can follow up with anyone if there are additional questions that haven't been addressed. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And once again, thank you to Sadie, Dr. Commander and Mary um, for your, your wonderful explanations and for your so for sharing your story and uh, Dr. Commander and Mary for your presentations. If you have any final words, uh, feel free to. So now. Yeah, I just, I wanted to thank um, JD and Amy for their support tonight. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Devin, for everything. So, and, and for all of you listening, we appreciate the support. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure with you, being with you ladies. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.